it's reasonable to say that Bitcoin is a better version of gold. It's definitely a better medium of exchange than gold. The fact that you have a decentralized network, uh, which now, as we know, after 15 years of being operational, has never been hacked. For countries that depend on US dollar for their economic stability, they would go for a decentralized crypto asset like Bitcoin. Can you predict the inflation rate of uh, India? Can somebody predict the inflation rate for Australia or you US? You do it for the US. Nobody can do it, right? The unique monetary policy of Bitcoin, which is the best thing about Bitcoin, is that its inflation rate is predictable. Price is not only about the fundamentals, but a lot about market structures right. and uh, behavioral finance. And sentiments of people. Exactly. He mined 10,000 Bitcoins and he yes. used those mined coins to buy the pizza. Yes. What exactly is mine? Thank you so much for doing this. I think this is our first podcast on cryptocurrencies and uh, we have talked a lot about stock markets. We have talked a lot about particular stocks, individual stocks and how, you know, uh, people of our age group can really invest in the markets. But crypto is an exciting field and I'm pretty sure all of us are very keen to understand how exactly it works because the moment we understand how exactly it works, that is when we are able to make a decision whether to invest in cryptos or not. So, uh, I do not think there's a better person to let us know about cryptos, who, who understands the subject really well, who has been teaching it, practice, practicing it for a long time now. So, thank you so much for doing uh, this podcast with us. We are really excited for your course as well that is coming on Upsource platform. So, first thing first, Shiv, uh, please tell us about some history about cryptos. How did it evolve? Where did it come from originally? Sure. Now, first of all, thank you very much. I think uh, I need to... Thank you all, you being the founder of Upsearch Club and the team at Upsearch Club. You guys have been very nice uh, with the production of the course as well. Uh, but also with the fact that, uh, you know, you guys are introducing this for a global audience. And the course that we are teaching, which is Introduction to On-Chain Analysis, is such a niche field that even some of my friends in Wall Street are having difficulty defining the talent. So the fact that we are going to introduce it to a global audience that includes India as well is something that I'm very excited and I was so excited to partner up with you and get our partners at Glassnode and the Artemis Terminal, which is the Bloomberg Terminal equivalent for crypto, uh, to help us in this endeavor. So thanks a lot to you as well. Um, coming to your question on uh, the history of crypto. So let me firstly preface that there have been a lot of attempts to build an internet native uh, currency. Uh, there was eCash. Uh, there were various attempts. Uh, one of the uh, earliest American cryptographers, David Chom, uh, you know, he was uh, a big innovator in the field of uh, cryptography. They all attempted to build an internet native currency, but they all failed at various different stages. And especially the problem was that how do we remove an intermediary in doing this thing? Because if there is an intermediary, then with the advent of the internet, uh, we do not need, you know, uh, like uh, an internet native currency because then people can facilitate it through the internet technology using intermediaries like banks and Visa and MasterCard. Uh, so there were a lot of theoretical concepts around blockchain technology on smart contracts. Um, early till from 1970s till 2000 even. But uh, it was actually in 2008 with the, the white paper that was introduced by a pseudonym with the name Satoshi Nakamoto uh, with the title Bitcoin White Paper, uh, a decentralized network. Which, which year was this? 31st October 2008. Okay, all right. Yeah, so that's when uh, the Bitcoin white paper was introduced. Okay. And, uh, you know, it was basically talking about that uh, we're working on a decentralized value exchange network. And then on 3rd of January 2009, the first uh, transaction, the first block, which is called the Genesis block, because it's the first block, uh, happened for the Bitcoin network. Was it a result of the financial crisis that happened in 2008 or there's no link? Yes. To it? So I think that's a very important question. Uh, the reason why a lot of people within the crypto industry believe that there is a connection is because the Genesis block that was introduced, it had a coded message. And in that coded message, it had the news of uh, Bank of England 
uh, you know, bailing out a commercial bank. So it's all speculative because nobody knows who founded uh, Bitcoin. As we said, that it was a pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. But because there was this coded message in the Genesis block that a central bank or, you know, a country is bailing out a commercial bank. And if you would appreciate 2007 to 2009, especially in the Western world, uh, the emotions were really high as to the global financial crisis and how taxpayers' money is being used to bail out banks who took the risk. Okay. And whereas people who had mortgages, they're now going to the streets so that need to downsize. So that's where a lot of people believe that uh, the motivation to build this was uh, because of the global financial crisis and to find out a decentralized method of value exchange. But just a quick thing that I want to mention, whatever might be the motivation, it shouldn't deviate from the fact that what a technological innovation was produced with this. The fact that you have a decentralized network uh, which now, as we know, after 15 years of being operational, has never been hacked and is supremely unbeatable when it comes to its uncensored data and being imitable. You need to applaud the technological innovation, and that's why SEC. So yeah, the moment when it uh, when the first transaction happened through uh, blockchain uh, it was in 2009, as you said. Yeah. What was the value of uh, Bitcoin back then? Great question again. There was no value. Okay. So you got to appreciate that this was not a startup funded, venture capital funded project, right? This was just a, a group of people that decided that we want to build a cryptographic secure, decentralized network without an intermediary. And let's see whether it works. And uh, people started mining Bitcoin because it uses a proof of work consensus system. The first value that can be associated, like the first dollar value that can be associated to Bitcoin happened in 2010 when somebody accepted 10,000 Bitcoins to uh, provide two pizzas. So that is called the Bitcoin Pizza Day. So that happened in 2010. And this is an important point to appreciate because the people who were initially part of the Bitcoin ecosystem, there was no market for Bitcoin. There was no dollar value. They didn't even know there would be any value associated with it. So is the guy who bought pizzas for Bitcoin regretting right now? Uh, I do not know. But uh, he, the person who sold his 10,000 Bitcoins to buy the two pizzas, he often comes in interviews because uh, the Bitcoin Pizza Day happens in May. So whenever it's May of every year, he gets a lot of interview requests. And he's like, you spend 10,000 Bitcoins to buy two pizzas. Do you regret it? So he often says that, look, at that time, there wasn't even any market. So uh, I had 10,000 Bitcoins because I mined it. And I wanted to see whether somebody would be interested. So he posted it on the Bitcoin Talk forum. And somebody said, okay, I'll take those 10,000 Bitcoins and I'll give you two pizzas. And then after that, people started realizing, okay, there is probably a demand. So let's create crypto exchanges out there. Right. And it's not just me. You can go to YouTube. Uh, you'll find there are some videos from 2010, 2011, where people are spending $10 to buy 30 Bitcoins using PayPal and stuff. So uh, what exactly differentiates a very traditional currency that we have been using for about, I think, 70, 80 years right yeah. now versus uh, a currency like crypto, like Bitcoin? I, yeah. I'm, I might be wrong in calling uh, Bitcoin yeah. a crypt, uh, currency, mm -hmm. but what is the exact difference between a, a crypto or yeah. the traditional money that we have been using? It's a great question again, Kunal. And I wrote my book, Protocols of Money, which is history and evolution of money, which takes a reader on how money as a concept and as an instrument evolved. And I'm glad that you asked that how money in the last 70 to 80 years have evolved. So just a quick preface, which you already know, but for our audience at Upsurge Club, that uh, the money that we know of now in 2024, uh, whether it's US dollar or whether it's Australian dollar, where I'm from, or Indian rupees, is not the same as it used to be pre-1971. Right. And that's because in 1971, the US president at the time, Richard Nixon, decided that currencies are no longer gonna be gold-backed currency. Right. So pre prior to 1971, currencies used to be backed by gold. Right. And that is considered commodity theory of money, which is that money is backed by something right. intrinsic, right. Uh, which the instrument used to be precious metal like gold. Since 1971, we all are running a risk of, uh, you know, uh, the central bank being too powerful, right? 
Well, yeah, you can say that. I need to choose my words carefully on how I phrase this thing. But from 1971, when Richard Nixon, the president at that time, decided that we were going to go and, uh, you know, money is not going to be backed by gold, we entered a free floating exchange environment. Right. And that, among a lot of economists, is considered the credit theory of money, right. where the central banks have got the authority to print more money. Right. And a lot of the visionaries in economics at that time decided this might be the end of capitalism. And I'm quoting that. There were certain people within the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank that said that this could, might, might mean the end of capitalism. Now, in my humble opinion, I think credit theory of money is also good because a lot of the growth that we've seen in uh, global markets is because of credit right. theory of money. However, it needs to be you know, managed well. And that's where we have problems like the Zimbabwean central bank, right. where the Zimbabwean dollar can you know, inflate their currency and then we see trillion dollars worth of notes. So with the credit theory of money, your central bank governors, the people in charge needs to manage it well. I mean, look at what's happening in Turkey. Right. Turkish lira is more volatile than Bitcoin. So before I talk about Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency, we need to appreciate that the current version of fiat currencies that we see is not what it used to be more than 53 years ago, right? It used to be commodity theory of money. Now we've got credit theory right. of money. So now let's define what is money. There is a consensual agreement that the definition of money or characteristic of money is that it needs to solve three things. It needs to be a unit of account. It needs to be a medium of exchange and it needs to be a store of value. Right. I'm, I think I'm going back to my 12th grade. Yeah, it, but the best things are in the basics, right? Let's keep it simple. So three characteristics, unit of account, medium of exchange, store of value. So let's see whether Bitcoin fits into this as well or not. Store of value. We already know Bitcoin is an amazing store of value. It's at an all time high. Uh, SEC has approved. Now pension funds are buying Bitcoin in an ETF format. In Switzerland, you can pay taxes in Bitcoin if you want. Uh, so it's a good store of value. Uh, now let's talk about whether it's a good medium of exchange or not. It's definitely a better medium of exchange than gold. So for all the people who think gold is money because of tradition, I think it's it's reasonable to say that Bitcoin is a better version of gold because it's portable and it's digitally native and you can exchange it, uh, you know, easily than gold and it's fungible. How would you exchange gold bars? But is it better than the fiat money that we've been using and today? I'll talk about that, but quickly I want to cover unit of account as well because a lot of people say Bitcoin is not a unit of account. Bitcoin not being a unit of account is not the Bitcoin network's problem or its tokens problem. It's a jurisdiction problem. So if you go to El Salvador, you go to stores over there and there is a video. If you go to McDonald's in South America, they give you the option whether you want to pay it in fiat currencies or in Bitcoin. Right. So the problem of unit account is actually a jurisdiction problem. Right. If the jurisdiction of that area allows you to, then Bitcoin could be considered a unit of account as well. Now, I can appreciate why certain countries don't want to do it because of their capital control system. But uh, to say and target Bitcoin and saying it's not a unit of account, it's not a Bitcoin's problem, it's the jurisdiction's problem. Coming to your question, because I want to address that as well. Is it better than fiat currencies? Uh, see, a lot of the people in the Bitcoin community who are called Bitcoin maximalists, okay. and maybe they'll troll. What, what, uh, what is the meaning of this term? Basically, what it means is that for them, it's Bitcoin or nothing. Okay. Uh, I don't subscribe to that. Because I'm a student of economics and because I'm a student of economics history as well, I realize the limitation of having, you know, like a scarce commodity theory of money as well. So from that respect, I believe that uh, Bitcoin and fiat currencies can coexist. Central banks and Bitcoin can coexist. And we do not need to go further and just see what's happening in Switzerland and USA and UK and Australia where both CBDCs and Bitcoin are flourishing. So over a period of time, say, for example, uh, Bitcoin takes over fiat money and the acceptance among people is on the higher side of, uh, for cryptos. Wouldn't it be the case that central bank lose a lot of its power on how they want to uh, control the money supply, control the monetary policies, control the inflation rates and all those things? Look, it's a very good question. It will be challenging for them to control it because Bitcoin is decentralized. But they should need to think of it from the perspective of free market. We 
it's reasonable for, I believe we would be in agreement that capitalism is the best uh, It is the form, best way to grow. Best way to grow, right? Do we have capitalism in national currency? Not really. It's a monopolistic environment, right? So that's why we have issues like the Zimbabwean hyperinflation or the Turkish uh, lira volatility. So who gives undemocratic leaders to decide the fate in terms of monetary policy for millions and billions of people? But wouldn't it be the case that if this power is not given, a lot of countries would collapse? I agree with that. And that's why both of them needs to exist in competition. That's what my theory and that's what I advocate that it shouldn't be choosing one over the other. Both of them should coexist and both of them should keep a check on others. Fiat currencies, if it's managed well, well, it should keep a check on the Bitcoin community over there. People would automatically choose fiat currencies then. But if fiat currencies like in a certain country that I've given off an examples are not keeping a check, then for them it's Bitcoin, right? So it creates that competition, which we need, which we never had, right. because we didn't have the decentralized layer to it. But since 2009, we have now. So, uh, you know, while I read about cryptos, you know, there's one very interesting thing that I've seen. And since it is new, uh, given that it's been only 15, 16 years, a lot of people interchangeably use cryptos, blockchain and Bitcoin, you know, and they think that they mean the same. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure they mean very different. Absolutely. So what is a crypto? What yes. is a Bitcoin and yeah. what is a blockchain? If you can explain all three. I'm glad you asked this question. Another great question. Uh, before I directly address it, I do want to point out that whatever we've discussed so far is only for Bitcoin. And I always, whenever I speak, whether it's in classroom to my student or for any media event, I always say there is Bitcoin and then there is crypto. And it's very important to create that distinction. Bitcoin is the most decentralized network and the most decentralized currency out there that doesn't have any startup founder. There are no founders and it was never backed by any venture capital fund. They didn't do any crowd sale, nothing. It was, so Bitcoin is not a crypto? Well, technically it is crypto, okay. but it's important to distinguish because the technology is similar, right? Uh, it uses cryptography to secure the okay. network. It uses blockchain technology like the rest of them as well. There are differences in proof of work consensus mining and proof of stake. So it is a crypto technology. It is a cryptocurrency. But think of it like that, that gold, silver, platinum, they all are precious metals. But from a monetary premium perspective, people always associate there is gold and then there is silver and platinum. Like nobody says that keep platinum in your central bank reserves, right? right. Nobody says that keep diamond in your central bank reserves, right? They always say gold. gold. Why? Because gold traditionally has that monetary premium because right. it isn't used much for industrial right. use case. Uh, I'll directly answer your question that you say, but a very important thing that I need to suggest over here is that in my humble you know, hypothesis of where I see Bitcoin going and crypto assets going, Bitcoin will eventually become a reserve asset for central banks. Okay. So it is friends of central banks, just like how it is friends of a sovereign individual. Right. For countries that depend on US dollar for their you know, economic stability, they would go for a decentralized crypto asset like Bitcoin. And so from that perspective, we are already seeing certain African nations. We already know El Salvador right. accepts Bitcoin and holds Bitcoin as their reserve asset. There is increased interest in the Middle East to do it which we all know why, because they want to get out of the petrodollar market. So increased interest in Bitcoin, but not increased interest on other crypto assets. Okay. And that's why the distinction between Bitcoin and crypto. Now, what is blockchain technology? Blockchain technology is a technology like Internet of Things, like artificial intelligence. It's not a financial asset or a commodity. Okay. It is a technology. Bitcoin is a network. Yes, it is a technology. So one can say it is a technological asset. But also it's got a market price inherent in it in the form of a token. So it's a financial asset as well, which is considered a commodity in most of the countries. So Bitcoin, crypto, two different things that is, uh, you know, uses blockchain technology. But blockchain technology could be a private blockchain technology. Okay. Like IBM has got its own blockchain technology called IBM Hyperledger. Okay. Amazon has got its own uh, uh, blockchain technology called Amazon uh, quantum ledger. So blockchain technology doesn't mean it's crypto. Not all blockchain uh, startups require crypto. 
I've invested as part of being an LP at a fund, invested in a blockchain project based out of the US, and they don't have a token. They use that technology to ensure that the construction supply chain management is trackable because it's an, on an immutable blockchain ledger. Hopefully that answers your question. It does, but stage. since we were, like I'll go back to yeah. our previous answer, since we spoke about Bitcoin being one of the reserves for central banks. Some of but, them are accepting yeah. it. But the kind of volatility currently yes. Bitcoin has, yes. I think uh, the moment it becomes a reserve, there is a lot of uh, volatility in your reserves that you are keeping. Yes. But with regards to gold or with regards to maybe a yes. US dollar, that kind of volatility we do not really see. Uh, yeah. with respect to the reserves that we are keeping. Yeah. So how do you think banks would at the end of the day tackle this volatility because one day your reserves are about mm. a billion dollars mm -hmm. and the next day it comes to maybe half a billion dollars. Yeah. So how does central bank yeah. manage that? Great question. I'm glad you pointed this out. I totally agree that when compared to gold, when compared to US dollar, uh, it is more volatile. But one thing to keep in mind is that US dollar has been in existence for like hundreds of years now uh, in a free floating environment for 53 years. Gold has been trading on markets for, again, more than 50 years. Bitcoin only had its price created in 2010. So it's been 14 years. So one key thing to look at, and anybody can do this, but, uh, you know, academics have done this research. And that's why I can claim this, what I'm going to claim soon that Bitcoin has reduced, the Bitcoin's volatility has reduced over time significantly to the extent that Turkish Lira is more volatile than Bitcoin. Okay. So, and, and Turkey, yes, it's not as big of an economy to participate in G8 discussions, but it's one of the major economies out there. Is it one of the, one of the reasons for the reduction in volatility? Is it the supply of Bitcoin that has gone so, down drastically? Exactly. So there are a lot of different uh, reasons why this has happened. One of them is because of the unique monetary policy of Bitcoin, which is the best thing about Bitcoin, is that its inflation rate is predictable. Can you predict the inflation rate of uh, India? Can somebody predict the inflation rate for Australia or you can do it for the US? Nobody can do it, right? Because we do not know how much monetary supply the central banks of the in. jurisdiction will choose to do, right. whether it's quantitative easing or quantitative easing. Bitcoin has got a fixed supply. 21 million uses proof of work consensus system to mine Bitcoin. After every four years, the reward fee get all. Uh, I'm glad all of our students will go through in detail in this course about how it works. But yeah, just quickly, like uh, Bitcoin halves after every four years. So its inflation rate is predictable. And that's why it's sound monetary economics and price, right? I mean, we all know being, uh, you know, participants in the financial markets, price is not only about the fundamentals, but a lot about market structures right. and uh, behavioral finance. And sentiments of people. Exactly. So while Bitcoin goes from $16,000, like it was, uh, uh, you know, last year to now at $70,000, Bitcoin as a technology still functions the same way. It doesn't care whether FTX was a Ponzi scheme or, a, a, you know, a president gets elected that nobody thought about. Every 10 minutes, the technology keeps up working. Shit. Exactly. It continues to facilitate transactions. Uh, so price volatility has reduced over time to the extent that now it is less volatile than, you know, the 20th or the 25th largest economy of the world, uh, which is Turkey. I do not know. So don't quote me how large the economy is, but it's one of the largest right. economies. So... I'm not saying that they should put all their reserves in Bitcoin, just like how an individual shouldn't put all their money in Bitcoin, you know, but there is a certain allocation, which I feel should be put there. We, we were discussing about the pizza story. So it yeah. came back to my mind. I just wanted to understand. You mentioned one word and I think a lot of people might not even understand yeah. the meaning of that word is that he mined 10,000 Bitcoins and he yes. used those mined coins to buy the pizza. Yes. What exactly is mining? So that's a great question as well. And that's where I'm going to try to simplify the complexity about it. But if you want to go to complex, then of course, we've created a course for people to check it out. Uh, but trying to simplify the complexity is that how does gold get produced or enter into the market? We've got gold companies that explore do the feasibility study and extract gold, refine gold, and then it gets produced into a gold bar. Similarly, with Bitcoin, there is a similar process where instead of like gold extraction equipments, you require computer, computational power. 
which now is at a level that requires multitude of supercomputer connected together to solve cryptographic puzzles in order to win a reward fee. So basically there is a game theory competition between computational powers right. in whatever geography that compete to solve who's gonna win facilitating the next block, which happens every 10 minutes without any you know, uh, intervention. Right. So that process is called mining. And there is a Coinbase transaction, which means that in order to facilitate the block, they earn a reward, a reward fee, which constitutes of the Bitcoin fee, which is at the moment 3.125, but it used to be 50 Bitcoin when it was first started. Oh. So at that time, the difficulty level wasn't that much as well, where we can use our consumer grade laptops, like a MacBook can be used, or my 64 gig hard drive with the four gig RAM can be used at that time in 2009 to mine Bitcoins. So at that time, the reward fee used to be 50. Now it's 3.125. Okay. So people who, you know, mine using their computers, they just were killing it. But to be fair, at that time, they didn't know that Bitcoin will become what it became now. So what exactly is the mining process? Do I need to solve some puzzle? Do I need to solve some mathematical right equation? Question. So you basically go to Bitcoin.org or you can go to any other mining pool websites and you can start the Bitcoin mining software and you become part of the network in order to mining to facilitate the transactions. However, the difficulty level of Bitcoin is so much now, which actually is a feature because they want to make sure that the difficulty level increase, which makes it virtually impossible to hack the network. So now if anybody tries to mine Bitcoin using their consumer grade laptops, chances are they're not gonna be able to mine anything because you need really high intensity supercomputational powers. And that's why mining companies is a multi-billion dollar industry, just like how gold mining companies, like, for example, now cannot go and just start mining gold, right? Right. But back in the day in the 18th century, especially in Australia, in Australia where I'm from, like we had a gold rush in the 19th century and people just used to get their tools right. and used to just start mining gold, but now they can't. So something similar has happened in the Bitcoin mining industry where back in the day, you can use your consumer grade laptops to mine Bitcoin, but now the difficulty level is so much that you wouldn't win against those supercomputers. So, but what is my incentive? So the Pisa guy got about $50 for mining one crypto. So he had to do what, 200 cryptos? Yes. And he simply could you know, yes. go get those 10,000 uh, Bitcoins. Yes. But right now, since the incentive is so less, it's about $3, as you said. 3.125 Bitcoin. Bitcoin, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So what would be my incentive to, you know, actually go and mine those 3.125 Bitcoins? Yes. Another great question. So firstly, we have uh, you know, made it clear that as an individual, if you want to try to mine Bitcoin, it's uh, not an economical, viable way to get anything right. because you wouldn't be able to mine anything Correct. because you're competing against the supercomputers. So now let's talk about the Bitcoin mining companies and what is their incentive to mine Bitcoin. Now, first of all, they believe that Bitcoin value is uh, undervalued and it's going to continuously go high. And I'm going to try to draw a parallel with gold mining companies over here. Why does a gold mining company mine gold? It is a very capital intensive business, right? They do it because they believe that gold is a great inflation hedge and gold prices are going to continue to go up. Something similar is believed by people within the Bitcoin you know, community and Bitcoin mining industry. So that is one, the incentive that Bitcoin is going to go high. That's our hypothesis. So now let's talk about the cost of production. Just like how in order to mine gold, there is a cost of production right. involved. Similarly with Bitcoin, there is a cost of production involved, which means that investing in those supercomputers, uh, it's called ASIC miners. Ant mining is one of the biggest manufacturer for it. So you get those computers, you do some deals with Nvidia as well, because their GPU makes uh, processing computational faster for these mining rigs as well. But most importantly, the biggest cost is the variable cost of electricity, right? For Bitcoin mining, is the electricity. And that's where you, an, you get another aspect of game theory in it, where you get the cheapest and the most efficient 24 seven electricity, people go set up their operations there. Which country is that? Glad you asked that. 
I would like to tell all of our global audience over here that are not aware that the Kingdom of Oman, for example, have invested $1.1 billion to state sponsor and mine Bitcoin. So the Middle Eastern countries, they've got a lot of energy and we're seeing a lot of great interest over there to use their you know, extensive surplus energy to use it for Bitcoin mining. But if you look at statistically at the moment, it's still uh, US, uh, Canada, uh, Iceland is big. Uh, China, surprisingly, even though they have banned Bitcoin, they still mine Bitcoin. Uh, Everybody wants some part of the cake, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so it's some geopolitics there, which is for another uh, podcast. But a uh, lot of countries are mining Bitcoin, but it's on those jurisdictions where they can get tax subsidies from the government for cheaper electricity. And, you know, it's surplus electricity there. Till date, how many Bitcoins have been mined and how many are yeah. left? If there's there a yes. supply country? A absolutely. So there is only going to be 21 million Bitcoin out there. Okay. Bitcoin, after all, is a decentralized public permissionless network. So it's an open source program. Anybody can go to its GitHub repository and verify it themselves. For, so for individuals to think, how do you know it's only going to be 21 million? There's a GitHub repository where you just check the code. It's always going to be 21 million, right? So the last Bitcoin is going to be mined in 2140. How are we so sure about the year? Because after every four years or after every 210,000 blocks, the reward fee or Bitcoin gets halved. So just like how it was 50 Bitcoin in 2009, it's 3.125. And all the new Bitcoin gets mined. Nobody gets artificially created, right? Right. It's the mining process that, you know, uh, creates the new Bitcoin. So that's why we have come up with the statistic, and not just me. I mean, I depend on the academics before me, but the education that I provide. But 2140 is when the last Bitcoin would be mined. So your question, what is the circulating supply now? Don't quote me on it, because after every 10 minutes, new Bitcoin gets mined. Uh, but I think it's somewhere around 19 million. Dollars. Okay, so we have 2 million more left. Yes. Sort of. Uh, on the very similar lines, uh, the geographies and the countries who have been investing in mining so much, are they only investing in mining Bitcoin per se, or they're also investing in mining other cryptos? Great question again. And uh, our students will be experts in this by the time they finish the course, because we've gone through in detail about this thing. But uh, so there are two different consensus system out there. There is Bitcoin, which uses proof of work, which is energy intensive, right? right. That's why we require uh, electricity for it and the difficulty level is high. Uh, the most famous proof of work consensus uh, crypto is Bitcoin. The second most is Dogecoin. I'm not going to talk Dogecoin, which is Elon Musk's favorite uh, crypto. The dog recently died. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that. Uh, but we covered a little comparative analysis between Dogecoin and Bitcoin just to prove to people what looks like a sound monetary principles and what looks like a speculative asset, which according to me is Dogecoin. But Bitcoin uses proof of work. What is the second most popular crypto asset out there, which is Ethereum, which we have covered on our course as well. Ethereum uses proof of stake. What is the difference between both? Yes. Proof of work. I'll try to simplify the complexity over here. If you have 18 million out of the 19 million Bitcoins, let's say, you still have no control over how the next Bitcoin would get mined because that is proof of work. It doesn't matter how much Bitcoin you have. In proof of stake, like the name suggests stake, how much Ethereum you hold is directly proportional in your ability to secure the network, to govern the network, and your rewards are also directly proportional to the stake. And that's why it is 99% energy efficient because they are not solving cryptographic puzzles. They are basically using their existing stake in Ethereum to build more, to secure the network and to, to facilitate mine. and yeah, mine more. They call them validators. They are not called miners, they are called validators. So that's the difference between proof of work and proof of stake at a simplified level. Is there a supply constraint to Ethereum as well or yes. it can be mined as much as we want? Yeah, uh, another great question. So in 2021, first of all, you need to realize that both Bitcoin and Ethereum are decentralized networks. 
So the decisions that are made over there are done in a very similar fashion as how a democratic nation chooses to pass bills, which is you need to get majority in order to execute on the plan. Okay. So similarly, with the Bitcoin and Ethereum, both of these decentralized networks, you start off by introducing an improvement proposal. Right. And there's a difference between democracy and these decentralized networks is that in a democracy, you depend on your representative electives right. to come up and introduce a bill. Right. In these decentralized networks, as long as you have stake in it, as long as you're a community member, anybody can introduce an improvement proposal. And then there is voting mechanism to decide what to execute about. So in Ethereum in 2021, we had the Ethereum investment proposal 1559 that was introduced that decided to introduce an algorithm that automatically creates Ethereum in a deflationary environment. Now, what do I mean by that? First of all, it doesn't have a big supply, right? But depending upon the popularity of the network, which is gauged by how many people are actually using that network, and we've covered this in our course on how to look at on-chain analysis, there are 500,000 active addresses on a daily basis at any given time on Ethereum. So depending upon the amount of transactions that happen on the Ethereum network, it will automatically issue more Ethereum or burn more Ethereum, which could be considered similarly as a stock buyback, but in real time for people from the equity world. So does this keep the inflation number intact for it? Absolutely. That's what the goal was for this algorithm, that to introduce a deflationary mechanism, but in an automated way so that there is no human intervention involved, there is no biases involved, automatically depending on the congestion of the network, it will either issue more, so to incentivize more usage, or it will burn more to basically incentivize the appreciation of the Ethereum price. But doesn't the autocracy of the guy who developed the entire algorithm lies with him? No, uh, because the Ethereum investment proposal, first of all, was only executed after the Ethereum community voted on it. Okay, all right. So that was the majority. And of course, the code, I mean, just like any other software. But code. again, the proof of stake concept would kick in where somebody would have a majority stake and might yeah. can play around with it. Absolutely great question out there. And uh, while we have covered Ethereum in this course, and I am of the strong opinion, that Ethereum will continue to be a decentralized network. That's where I sometimes suggest that Ethereum to me is not a monetary asset, at least not now. Bitcoin is, because like I said, in Bitcoin, even if you hold 18 million Bitcoin, you still can't control the Bitcoin ecosystem. But for Ethereum, it is still a decentralized network because when you look at the statistics of the uh, technologies that are controlling the staking, Nobody has even reached the 33% mark. So, uh, but it's theoretically possible because all it takes is to buy 51% of Ethereum, right? I'm pretty sure our audience would also would want to know what are the other popular cryptocurrencies apart from Bitcoin and Ethereum. So they might be investing in these two. I'm sure. But uh, what are some of the other popular uh, currencies yeah. if there are any? Look, good question. And I'm glad that you asked me in this podcast because it's an important question to address, especially for me as somebody who's been educating uh, this space and uh, things like FTX really hurt the good actors in this space, right? So I'm going to answer your question by firstly saying that for the audience over here, especially the upsurge audience, do not invest in anything that you do not know about, right? And if you do not know anything about crypto, don't invest in it. That's why we've created this course. And that's why this course is a fundamental analysis course. This is not technical analysis where you draw lines on the chart, which has its own merits. But just like how when you invest in a company, you look at the balance sheet over here, you want to look at the crypto network and underlying data. So the other popular cryptos out there are Solana. There is Ripple. There is Stellar. There is Aptos. I can go on and on. So the tech, the tech, uh, the technology that has been used to drive all these other cryptos, is it similar to Ethereum or is it different for all of them? They all are blockchain technology projects, but they all have different consensus system. So let me just firstly tell you what role does the consensus system play? 
Blockchain technology is a database technology, right? It makes sure that data is stored there. It's immutable. Uh, that's what it does. Blockchain is a database technology. So what role does a consensus system play? The role of consensus system is in a decentralized technology is that when I start a Bitcoin node, I do not know the other 5,000 people that are operating the Bitcoin node, right? But I need to find a mechanism in order to trust them. And that trust is facilitated through the consensus system. In Bitcoin, it's called proof of work. In Ethereum, it's called proof of stake. In Solana, it's called proof of history stake. They've got other fancy names as well for all the other blockchains, but they all have some nuanced differences, like their consensus system, uh, like the languages that uh, they use to build upon it. Like, for example, in Aptos, they use Move as the programming language to build dApps on it. In uh, Solana, they use Rust. In uh, Ethereum, it's Solidity. So they all have various differences, but the commonality between all of them is that they use cryptography to secure the network and the tokens, and they use blockchain technology. Right. So given the great knowledge that you have about cryptos, one thing is uh, very clear that uh, we have not studied this in school or college. Yes. We studied it some, somewhere else through someone yes. or through some other medium. So what yeah. was your source of learning everything about cryptos that yeah. you uh, know about? Look, another great question by you. Uh, I got into blockchain ecosystem because I was working in wealth management in Sydney and uh, researching alternative assets for a high net worth client. And Bitcoin has been legal in Australia since 2013 with clear regulations and taxation. And uh, the reason why I got into the rabbit hole of Bitcoin was because there was increased interest from Japanese clients uh, because Japan was going to introduce a bill around in 2016 make Bitcoin a legal tender of sorts. And that got me interested in it the same way gold as an alternative asset interest. So I was self-taught initially, but then I got the opportunity to do my MBA at NYU Stern. And over there, I studied it at an academic level under Professor Ian D'Souza, okay. who is a clinical professor of blockchain, behavioral finance, and venture capital there. And what I wanted to tell you about my experience is that being self-taught is great, but if you have a structured program, especially from somebody who's experienced, like right. Professor Ian D'Souza was. Thank you for Upsurge. Like <laughs> I am for Upsurge. It really accelerates your learning. Of course, there are other ways to accelerate your learning as well. is by just going and building your projects, starting your own Bitcoin node, attempting to mine Bitcoin. All those things are a good way to learn as well. But uh, structured learning or learning by doing will always be learning by, you know, just various different courses. Exactly. So that's how I learned. Right. And one last question. I of think course. a lot of people uh, would uh, have this in their mind. So we said that in the past 15 years where we have seen the history of uh, Bitcoin or any other crypto for that matter, there has never been a security breach or there has never been a tech concern per se. Yes. Do you think this will always sustain and there will never be a cyber risk yes. to cryptos or to Bitcoins? Another great question. And uh, like I said, I don't consider myself a Bitcoin maximalist, although I have a lot of respect for people who are in the right. Bitcoin maximalist community. Uh, but there is, of course, risk. You know, there is risk for everything. And one of the biggest technology risks, not only for Bitcoin, but for all crypto assets, is quantum computing. Okay. Because uh, if we have a super fast quantum computer, which at the moment doesn't exist of that right. level currently, in any country, because if they did, if, if there was, then not only crypto assets, but even the banking networks will get hacked. Correct. Because when you think about it, all of these, whether it's your banking service provider on the internet or Bitcoin or Ethereum, they all use encryptions, right? The SHA encryptions. So the only risk that people come up with for Bitcoin from a technology and a cybersecurity standpoint is that when we have a very super fast quantum computer, they'll probably be able to hack these encryptions, SHA algorithms. But that risk is not only for Bitcoin, that's risk for all crypto assets and all the other secured Web2 startups, right. banks, and so forth that also rely on the same encryption technology. Right. So I think, so uh, to be very honest, uh, I was a very 
I was a newbie to the entire cryptocurrency sure. world and this podcast I think gives me a lot of perspective about how exactly things work around maybe I will invest some money in Bitcoin and Ethereum as well which after I've seeing the course yeah uh, which which I've understood to a very great extent through this podcast and definitely once the course goes mm-hmm. live so thank you so much Shiv for taking our time I think it was a wonderful wonderful session yeah there was a lot to learn and this Karthik behind the camera here I'm pretty sure he's smiling and uh, he, I, he, he might have understood a lot of things about awesome. cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin. So thank you so much. Pleasure. It was, this was, it a, was, pleasure. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you.